First, I'd like to say uh, thank you to John for having me speak here today. Uh, never being in the Navy, but always been interested in it, in Navy history, it's, it's kind of a dream come, dream come true and quite, a, quite a, the honor to be able to speak to, uh, at the War College today about Naval history. Um, I thank you, the audience, for coming here and giving me this opportunity, because without you taking time of your day to come listen to me, uh, I would not have this opportunity. So I say thank you, and I know many of you are veterans, so I say thank you for your service as well. Oh, to the left. <laughs> is it the uh, gray one or the? Or is it? First, it's the old O-N O-F-F. <laughs> there, there we go. All right, so it's this, this one? The one on the left, yes. Okay, all right, thanks. All right, this is the fourth vessel to bear the name of, the Massa of Massachusetts. There were three other vessels before um, her to be called Massachusetts. This is the second battleship of the United States Navy. Um, she was built in uh, the late, eight, uh, late 1800s and she served in uh, the Spanish-American War. She fired on Cuban, ba uh, Cuban batteries and also in was involved in the blockade of Cuba. Here is the uh, fifth Massachusetts She's being built here at the Quincy Shipyard, and this is taking uh, one day before her launch date, so this would be September 22nd, uh, 1942. And right in front of the bow is a platform where she would be cr uh, christened the next day by the wife of uh, Charles Francis Adams, who was a former Secretary of the Navy and was also a member of um, Quincy's most uh, famous family. This is a big day for the Massachusetts as she steams. This is May 12, 1942. This is her commissioning day. She's being towed through the uh, Four River Bridge um, right in Quincy, heading on her way to Boston for her commissioning. Her commissioning, because it was during a time of war, happened at this. Um, she was commissioned at the South. Boston Navy, um, Navy Annex, but because it was a time of war, it wasn't really a, a big deal. There was, it was just something they had to commission her right away because as you know at this time, um, things were not really going well for the, um, the United States, so they needed to get her um, quickly into action as fast as possible. This is a picture here of the crew. Um, the Massachusetts had its own band it's a very large um, ship. Um, one of the things that the Navy had, well actually it goes back um, many years, is ship's dances. And this was a, an opportunity for the crew to come together. Since there were over 2,000, all these men uh, were basically strangers to one another. Some had, most had, had never been to sea before. They had never been in the Navy. A few had, but this ship's dances were an opportunity to for all the sailors to kind of, one, kind of do something uh, fun and get the stress and tension out because um, obviously being in the Navy is very strict and harsh discipline, but and they're also um, at a time of war. Um, this was an opportunity for the, the crew to kind of relax and have fun. What the Massachusetts carried, um, they, she carried between two and three scout fisher planes. As you see here, this is a picture of her. This is um, one of the planes on the fan tail. Actually, these ships would actually be catapulted off of the stern. And what they were used for, as this is a time that radar was kind of in its infancy, these planes, these uh, scout planes, would go ahead of the fleet and actually be the eyes of the fleet and be the radar, since radar was kind of still something new. So they would scout for the enemy. Also, what the, these planes would do was that they would um, call in fire adjustments. So once the Massachusetts was firing, one of these planes would be aloft and it would be circling and it would come and radio adjustments to the gunners saying, okay, you need to um, you know, come left a thousand yards. 
Um, something, not a job that I would want to do since the shells are flying right near you, but um, this is um, something, a very important job these planes would do. And the planes actually would be lifesavers as well because once the um, Massachusetts was in the Pacific, um, that the, those, these pilots um, would get the call to rescue aviators that had to ditch, whether the plane was damaged from the enemy or mechanical failure. Sometimes pilots couldn't make the carriers, so they had to ditch in the water. And these planes would be catapulted off, um, locate the, um, the pilot in the water, they would land and taxi over and rescue the pilot and then take off. Um, these planes would land right next to the Massachusetts and that crane, you can kind of see in the back, if you will, will would kind of come down, they would turn it down, and they could lower um, a cable down, and they would literally host, ho uh, hoist that plane back aboard the ship. So it was, and the, the Massachusetts would be credited with saving the lives of 780, seven aviators during World War II, uh, sometimes under hostile fire. Um, the Massachusetts was part of um, Operation Torch, the invasion of North Africa in November of 1942. This is where the, um, it is believed that the Massachusetts fired the first 16-inch shell of World War II against the enemy. Here's a picture of um, the, sh the uh, French battleship Jean Bart. She is actually firing at the USS Massachusetts in this picture. And, and the picture here is the destruction of the Jean Bart um, showing the damage done by the USS Massachusetts. During this action, the USS Massachusetts was hit a couple of times, but nothing serious. This is the um, picture here of showing the damage of the Jean Bart from bow to stern. Um, also, the Massachusetts was credited with um, sinking two enemy destroyers in this battle and she actually was fired, on, fired upon by an enemy submarine, but those torpedoes missed her. This is uh, just showing a uh, break in the action during the Naval Battle of, Ca Naval Battle of Casablanca. Um, two big American flags were flying there. Um, a lot of the flags were hit. Um, this is showing um, this is showing right here the after, that's the um, uh, after turret. The Massachusetts had three turrets, one up, two up front and one in the back. After the uh, naval, once the uh, victory was declared and uh, the USS Massachusetts, or she would be later nick nicknamed by the crew Big Mammy, um, sailed back to the States and operated off the East Coast especially in Portland, Maine, um, just getting ready to be sent to the Pacific. The crew would practice, um, practice training, firing the guns. Um, this is, um, by 1943, uh, the Massachusetts was in the Pacific. She would shell enemy um, islands that were uh, held by the enemy. She would um, also be used to protect aircraft carriers. Um, her five inch, she had 10 5 38 inch guns on her uh, port and starboard sides, and those were used to shoot down the uh, enemy aircraft. The Massachusetts would steam right next to the aircraft carriers, and as the enemy planes came in, those guns would open up and shoot down um, the Japanese aircraft. This is a birthday, um, just not really a good picture, but it's a uh, picture of. Um, the Massachusetts menu for um, her second birthday in 1944. So the crew went to great lengths to celebrate her birthday. They made up a special menu with special cake. And so it was quite the, the crew began to have a lot of um, affection for the ship. Um, and after her, um, while she was steaming back to, um, while she, on the way back, to Washington, that was when she celebrated her second birthday in May of 1944. But from May until July 1944, she was overhauled in Washington State at the Bremerton Shipyard. They had to reline her gun barrels and um, firing those 16 inch shells um, do a lot of, um, you know, can cause damage to the, the guns. 
Um, so they had to realign them and make some other adjustments to the ship. So by uh, August, she was heading back into the Pacific. This is a picture of um, the Massachusetts arriving in uh, Ulithia Tall in November of 1944. The Massachusetts was involved at, in the naval battle of Leyte Gulf. She actually was part of the northern force that chased um, with Admiral Hawsley the um, Japanese uh, northern fleet, or the, the um, ghost fleet, if you will, because they had aircraft carriers, but they had no, you know, they, they were more of a, uh, a decoy than anything. So the Massachusetts steamed with the carriers that um, attacked the, nor the Japanese nor northern force at the Battle of Leyte Gulf. Another um, an event that the Massachusetts was involved in was in December of 1944, Housie's Typhoon that caused the um, lo loss of over 800 sailors when three ships, three destroyers capsized at, um, as, they attempt, as they were attempting to refuel in a typhoon, if you will. <laughs> there were a lot of, um, that was something um, that the Navy obviously, um, it was a giant disaster, but the Massachusetts was involved with that task force that was trying to uh, refuel, but unfortunately they were in a typhoon and three destroyers capsized with the loss of over 300 sailors. I'm sorry, with over 800 sailors. Um, the Massachusetts was in part, um, part of both, operated with both the third and the fifth fleets in the Pacific. Here's, this is a picture of um, an, an aircraft carrier burning off of Okinawa, but the Massachusetts was in, um, involved in the invasion of Iwo Jima and Okinawa. The, the Navy um, lost almost 5,000 sailors um, off of Okinawa due to the kamikaze attacks. Being in a battleship, um, you were very, very um, uh, fortunate with all the armor involved, but um, the destroyers, um, other smaller ships obviously were, um, took a big brunt of the, of the, of the hits. Uh, the Massachusetts and Big uh, would affectionately be called Big Mammy by her crew or Mighty Mammy. Um, here, she, her guns are actually in this photograph. She's kind of behind the other ship here in the foreground. The Jap they're actually shelling the Japanese home islands in uh, August of 1945, right before the end of the war. So they, um, Massachusetts is credited along with you know the other ships of just. Um, Take, driving across the Pacific with the U.S. Navy from the Marshall Islands all the way to the Japanese home islands. The, uh, after the war, the Massachusetts was transferred to the East Coast and sent to Norfolk in uh, 1947. This is a picture of um, some of her sailors right before she was decommissioned. She st um, stayed in Norfolk from 1947 to 1963. Um, there she was, um, she sat waiting to serve her country again, but the call never came. Um, you can kind of see in this picture here that they're preparing her to be decommissioned and mothballed, if you will. There's ca some cocoons and different things they put on the guns. There's a lot that goes into preserving a <coughs> ship and taking it out of action and preserving it to be used later. So it was quite the undertaking, but she sat, um, she patiently waited just for, for her country to call again. Here's a picture here of um, former crew members and they're holding a, um, a flag of the Massachusetts Navy that goes back to the revolutionary times. In the early 1960s, the Navy decided to scrap the USS Massachusetts. When former, when former crew members read about, in the, in, read about it in the newspaper in 1963, they were obviously upset and wanted to save her ship, save, that, her, their own, save their ship for future generations. So what they decided to do was they were going to appeal to the governor of Massachusetts. The governor could create what they called the state commission, and by creating the state commission, you would pledge state money to preserve, to actually get the ship pay for the ship from the Navy 
and have it be donated from the Navy to um, the state, and the state would be paying for the funding. But when they approached the governor about it, he said no. He didn't want any part of it. We already have the USS Massachusetts. Um, the, we already have the USS Constitution. We don't need it. But the crew was not to be deterred. They realized, you know, they wanted to bring the Massachusetts home for a couple of reasons. One, it was their ship, but also they wanted to create a memorial, World War II memorial, for all the um, citizens killed in Massachusetts during World War II. So what they decided to do was they created the Massachusetts Memorial Incorporated. They created a nonprofit by 1964. They started. Uh, they went out to school children. They, every they went out to every um, school in Massachusetts asking if the children would donate. That was actually very successful because in the end, school children of Massachusetts would actually raise over half the money needed to to help save Massachusetts. Um, they did, um, they just did, dr they did drives, they sold, you know, support like commissions, honorary commissions. Um, a lot of companies um, donated supplies, um, stickers, printing, brochures, the whole works. They wanted to, it became a big, big, big story. And finally, by 1965, they had a, they had raised enough money to prove um, to, to have the Navy donate the ship and they also but they but the problem was and they didn't with a but without them they learned that the Navy was going to donate the ship and they realized that they were going to get this big giant battleship they had no place to put her because they realized that Boston didn't want her so they were really starting to be panicked obviously they had sent letters to every um, um, city council or, or mayors on the east coast of Massachusetts seeking, seeking if they'd want her. But they realized that the only mayor or town council they hadn't heard from was the mayor of Fall River. So they contacted the mayor of Fall River and he's, at the time, um, all these factories are leaving Massachusetts. The economy of his city is, is on the really downturn. So he said, sure, I'll take this tourist attraction. So right then and there, um, without a, you know, with a, a month to spare, they realized, okay, we're going to bring her to Fall River is going to be her home. So this is a picture here of the some of the former crew members f flew down or drove down or took buses because they were going to go um, aboard the, the Massachusetts and ride her back all the way back to um, to Fall River. This is a picture here of um, taken from the Massachusetts and it shows um, an aircraft carrier. In the background, this is kind of um, the changing of the guard, if you will, because you have this old, obsolete battleships, and and you have the new kind of the new navy, I guess, if you will, the aircraft carrier has replaced the battleship. So she's going out um, to Fall River. Here's a picture of the former crew members. Some of them um, posed for this photograph on the way to Fall River. Um, very excited to save their ship and bring her back to the home state. And here, here she is arriving at Fall River um, um, underneath the Braga Bridge in um, August of 1965. Um, this was a huge event covered by the media. Uh, the Navy was really involved. They had famous dignitaries and the governor. Um, they have all these pleasure crafts that came to welcome uh, the Massachusetts. They actually had to take some of off the mast. Before she left Norfolk, they had to literally cut some of that mast off or she wouldn't fit it underneath the uh, Braga Bridge. This is the, um, in August 1965, they dedicated her as the official World War II memorial to, um, in Massachusetts. They had a um, huge crowd to, as, um, as well. This is, this little uh, picture here is taken from the Massachusetts. They had a big um, ceremony. Um, VIPs, the, the Navy, the mayor, everybody, um, it was a big, big deal. And this is one of the reasons why I think the Massachusetts is, is so special. Um, in 1968, they dedicated and opened the, the memorial room. This is on the main deck, right behind the, um, the galley. And this is 
Um, this on the on the left here, you can see panels, and those are names of over 13,000 Massachusetts residents killed in World War II. There are, it doesn't matter what if they were in the Navy, Army, but everyone is listed um, by county, I believe. But there are over 13,000 names there, and she's the and she's the official state memorial to those killed in um, World War II. In 1968, she was moved to her present location um, as she appears today in her deep water mooring. In 1972, a um, scoutmaster wanted to see if he could have his, his Boy Scouts stay aboard the Massachusetts overnight. So this became um, one of the museum's most profitable um, events, nautical nights. What they do is they have, it's open um, to youth groups, camping groups, uh, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts. They're allowed to, um, all the boys, this is a picture of the kids coming aboard the Massachusetts with the sleeping bags. They do is they sleep in the same uh, bunks the sailors sleep in. They learn about tying knots and naval terminology. Um, they, they have a meet the veterans talk where a veteran will come and talk about patriotism and um, what it was like to serve in the military. They eat in the, in the galley, so it's quite the experience for them that they kind of living history that these children don't get to, you know, they get a better feel for it when they, they see how, how the uncomfortable the bunks were or how small the spaces were. Um, they really appreciate it. Another attraction at Battleship Cove is the Balo class submarine USS Lionfish. She was commissioned in November of 1944, and her first commanding officer was the son of Admiral Spruance. So he had a big connection to um, the Navy there. Um, by January, February 1945, she operated in the Pacific and conducted a few war patrols. She, the, her crew believes they sank an enemy submarine. Um, however, it's never been officially officiated, but um, the crew believe that they did. Um, when she was after the war, she was um, decommissioned. But by 19, the early 1950s, she served the Navy again um, at New London and also um, down in Florida as a school ship to get new submariners adjusted to, uh, to learn about submarines and, and sonar. So she was used as a school ship. 19, in 1952, she operated with the Sixth Fleet, so she did do one um, Sixth Fleet cruise. But the late 50s, um, she kind of was in and out of service, mainly used as a school ship. By 1971, she was decommissioned. In 1972, she was brought to Battleship Cove and kind of serves as a memorial to all submariners. When you go aboard here, you'll understand that being in a submarine is <laughs> not for everybody. So it's, it gives you a big, uh, a good indication of um, what being on a submarine is like. And here's a picture of what she looks like today. You're, um, you can come on board. The tour is given um, just forward, forward of that little f um, flag sticking up. And um, you can go in the spaces. They're really cramped. Um, but it's, 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 she had over 60 sailors um, in there. And when you walk and when you go down in, um, inside, you'll, you'll be amazed at how they, how they did that. This is a picture here of the oldest son of Joseph and Rose Kennedy, Joseph Kennedy Jr. This is a picture in uh, 1942 after he graduated from, um, he earned his wings, his aviator wings. His father is um, Joseph Kennedy Sr. obviously, but she, um, he's, he's had the honor of giving his son um, his aviation wings. This is a, um, this is Squanum Naval Air Station. Uh, today you can still walk around these grounds. This is actually in Quincy, um, and now it's turned into co uh, condos, but um, this is where he learned to fly um, in 1942. He did further um, training um, down in Florida. 
and eventually by 1943-1944 he was transferred over to England where he was used to fly over the North Sea and also the English Channel uh, scouting for U-boats. In August 1944, Joseph P. Kennedy Jr. volunteered for a very top secret mission. What his mission was basically to fly a B-25 Liberator filled with explosives and halfway to target he would, he and his co-pilot would parachute out of it and they would land on the ground and be rescued. Um, what the purpose of this mission was was that they were gonna, this, their plane would be a drone. It would be filled with explosives. They would bail out, and a B-17 would be behind the, the, uh, the, their plane, and the B-17 would use remote control radio guidance to ha ha literally fly that B-25 into a uh, V-2 rocket installation in France. This program was very top secret, very controversial, because it, in the end it didn't turn out to bear much fruit. Um, so during one of, the, one of uh, Joseph P. Kennedy Jr.'s first missions, he was flying uh, the plane along with his co-pilot. And over England, s something happened, they don't know what, and the plane exploded prematurely. So both he and his co-pilot were killed instantly. But like I said, the program, um, it, it was just a dangerous program, and they never knew what happened, but supposedly they, maybe a stray static, something set off the explosives. In April of um, 1945, the Navy started to build the um, a destroyer named after him, the Joseph P. Kennedy Jr. Again, this is in Quincy, Quincy Shipyard and she's um, beginning to come to life here. On July 26, 1945, she was launched. Um, this is a big event here. Um, the little boy holding his arms is actually Ted Kennedy. Um, and his, over his uh, right shoulder is Robert Kennedy Jr. And, I'm sorry, Robert Kennedy. Robert, Robert Kennedy would actually serve on this ship for about a couple of months in 1946. But this is her um, launching date at the Quincy Shipyard. This is uh, Jean Kennedy. She's the youngest daughter of the Kennedy family. And she was chosen to christen the JPK as she was the um, goddaughter of Joseph. She was commissioned in 1945 in December, uh, too late for World War II. Um, this is at the Boston Navy Yard. And once again, Jean Kennedy Smith is on hand for the, she's basically um, standing in the middle of the photograph underneath the gun turret. Here's a picture of the Kennedy um, right during the Korean War. In uh, January of 1951, both she and um, her destroyer squadron were off of Korea. Um, they provided direct um, fire support for troops pinned down by the enemy. They'd conducted shore bombardment on targets such as trains. Um, and one of, another important task of hers was to uh, screen aircraft carriers, use her sonar to listen for en enemy submarines, and also um, for plane guard duties, meaning basically she would steam behind the carrier as the uh, carrier was launching or recovering aircraft, and in case a pilot went into the water, um, the destroyer could help um, rescue the pilot. So the, destro the destroyer is kind of like the jack of all trades um, ship. She has many, many functions. So the, uh, one of the um, things that Kennedy also did in the um, Korean War was she served in the um, for a couple of months in the uh, Formosa Straits. What you would do is that she sailed in between um, Formosa and mainland China to prevent um, an invasion by the enemy forces on um, Formosa. Um, also, this is one of the um, 
time-honored traditions of, in the Navy is shellbacks and poly, polywogs. Anyone who's never crossed, they actually have ones for the, the Arctic, which is a blue nose. They have all <laughs> different things. But this is, um, the, this is when the ship crossed the equator. Um, if you were a shellback, that means you had crossed the equator, the crossed the equator before. So you didn't have to go through this hazing ritual. If you were a polywog, that meant you did, and that included the captain. If the captain of the ship was a polywog, he still had to go through this hazing ritual. So what they would do is that they take all these guys, make them run through garbage, crawl on their hands and knees through all muck and mire, sp be sprayed with hoses, have their hair cut, all sorts of things. But there would be a, once they survived that, they would become a shellback, and they would get an official certificate. So they never had to go through it. But this is quite the um, the ritual. Um, one individual who had a very close relationship with the ship was none other than John F. Kennedy. Obviously, he was named after his, um, what, his oldest brother. And this is a picture here of um, John visiting the ship as she was in Boston Navy Yard in 1952. Uh, John here had just won his election to be a, a U.S. Senator for the first time for Massachusetts. But here... Um, Sometimes the Navy does a lot of goodwill, um, and one of the things is sometimes they, um, they hold ship, ship parties for children, and this is such um, one of those events that John F. Kennedy um, attended. They were called Gray Diplomats because with the creation of the Sixth Fleet in the late 1940s, um, the U.S. Navy would steam all across the globe and this is a picture here of the, um, the Kennedy arriving in Monaco, France, and these sailors would kind of be, as they got off the ships, or in the, in the ships themselves, would you know, kind of be the American presence in Europe. So they had to, um, at this time, the Cold War is heating up, and uh, Russia is trying to you know, get a foothold into certain areas and in certain governments and communism is creeping. So the United States Navy would provide the, would be the watchdog, if you will, and would try to respond to different flare-ups, um, um, different um, situations that became destabled with other governments. Um, the Navy would kind of be the, um, would be on the call for the president to help keep the peace. This is a picture here of what they called underway replenishment. Um, the, on the left is a, a fuel ship, an oiler, um, providing um, fuel to the Kennedy. Destroyers used up a lot of fuel, so every, between almost every two to three days, she'd be need to be refueled. She could be refueled from a carrier. Um, but also, this was a very in, uh, dangerous operation, so sailors had to be very uh, careful. In 1959, she participated along with other, many other ships of the Navy in Operation Inland Sea. This is the opening of the um, St. Lawrence Seaway. Big, uh, very big um, PR event for the Navy because as these ships came in, they would stop at all various cities. So they would let the public come aboard um, their ships and c people would get to see the, these great ship, Navy ships and learn more about the Navy. Um, so she operated, she participated in um, that historic event. In the early 1960s, the U.S. Navy had a, a big problem because it had um, the Soviet Union. Soviet Union was um, building a lot of submarines and the U.S. Um, Navy, their destroyers at the time were of World War II vintage and the Navy didn't have a lot of funding to build new destroyers to um, to counter the Soviet submarine threat. So they decided to do a program um, to modernize them. So the the Kennedy went under what they call a fleet a fleet a, f a fram. It stands for Fleet Rehabilitation and Modernization. And basically, one of the changes was um, she had a more modernized pilot house, a bridge. It would be widened. It would have more. Um, um, all those uh, windows that you see were put in, but it was made wider um, and bigger, and new electronics and equipment were brought in. Um, another 
um, piece of equipment they brought in was this ASRock, which is anti-submarine rocket. This is actually installed behind our first uh, funnel. What this would do is that those um, cells, those little boxes, open up and a missile would be fired out and a parachute, um, it was, she would, the missile would come down, it could be, a, you know, it would be coming down to the water and then once it hit the water, it became activated. So then it would circle for the enemy submarine to destroy it. This was kind of what they called a standoff weapon because once the submarine is too close to you, um, you know, it could be too late for you to really get the sub before it gets you. So this was something they could use to get the submarine before the submarine could actually be within firing distance of the ship. And this is um, the other in, um, modernization they put on was called uh, DASH. It was a drone anti-submarine rocket. Helicopter. This is a <laughs> helicopter, yes. Sorry, helicopter. Helicopter. <laughs> drone anti-submarine helicopter. This is um, the first generation of drones that you um, see today. Um, underneath, this is a picture of um, two that the Kennedy actually has on board today. And underneath, the, the, um, you can see the two torpedoes. They kind of would use this as a remote control. They would um, literally, you could only fly basically line of sight and um, it could, once you had the enemy sub, you could fire the torpedoes. But the, by the late 60s, these helicopters were off of um, the destroyers. The program didn't seem to, um, to be too good. Um, John F. Kennedy would use the, um, um, use the uh, Kennedy as a viewing platform for the American Cup races in 19... In the, and uh, September of 1962, Jackie was aboard and the crew was very happy to have um, President Kennedy, so they built a model for him. And he was aboard for a couple of days and um, he was very happy because the ship meant so much to him. In October of 1962, the Kennedy was part of the blockade for the Cuban Missile Crisis. Here she is, um, this is a picture of her of um, stopping uh, Lebanese registered ship Marukala and the Kennedy lowered her whale boat and along with other crew members of the Pierce, she boarded and um, inspected the Marukala but no, and, uh, no contraband was found, no Cuban missile parts or anything like that. So after a two hour search, she was um, allowed to proceed to Cuba. In the late 60s, the Kennedy was part of um, the NASA um, and the Navy's afloat recovery teams. She was used to, um, along with the other ships, to help um, steam in a certain area when the astronauts were expected to land. And by the late 60s, the uh, Russians had a, a Navy presence in the Mediterranean and very important uh, for the Kennedy was kind of to shield aircraft carriers and p protect uh, them because the Russians would try to take photographs of what was happening. They would try to interrupt refueling operations and flight operations. So uh, the Kennedy would shepherd, kind of shepherd this, the Russian ships away. Uh, this is what they call the Fall River Navy today. They have the um, Kennedy, uh, the Lionfish, and the Massachusetts. Although this is more of uh, the late 70s because they would move the, the um, lionfish kind of in between the Kennedy and um, Massachusetts. Uh, one of the great programs Battleship Coves has is the Meet the Veterans talk. Here uh, is a Navy veteran talking to um, Cub Scouts and as I said earlier, the, the, um, this program is very good. It talks about, gives kids a chance to learn what life in the Navy is about, patriotism. I belong to a group called the JPK Volunteers and once a month um, what we do is we go aboard, this, aboard the ship and help chip paint and preserve it for future generations. Sometimes we have weekends where we stay aboard the ship and um, it's a great time for camaraderie and fellowship. Anyone can, get, anyone can get involved in this group. 
And this is a, photo, a group photo during one of our weekend field days. It's civilians, Navy veterans, everybody coming together to help preserve the ship. Um, the Battleship Cove has two PT boats. Um, one of them is PT-796. Uh, she was used as um, PT-109 during JFK's inaugurational parade. Um, she was towed out of the water. Her, she was painted with 109 and she was towed as a float. Um, she wasn't the same type that PT-109 was, but that really, they just wanted to you know, have a PT boat. <laughs> Um, she opened to the public in 1976. Um, this, she first opened as a um, kind of on a concrete pier, but obviously that wasn't going to work out too well because the elements were going to destroy her. So they actually found a Quonset hut, um, moved that to Fall River, and put her inside that to preserve her from the elements. Um, here's another PT boat, uh, PT-617. This is another one of the exhibits. Visitors can't go on board these boats, but they can walk, they can access them by walking around them on a, a walkway. And this is what Battleship Cove looks like today. Um, you can visit it. It's open most, um, every, for every day except holidays. Um, but there's, there's uh, they have a website where you can check out that we have, they're getting involved with special events now. Um, they're having, um, they have like, they had a D-Day, um, a D-Day day, they, um, not too long ago during the, celebrating the anniversary of D-Day. They have, um, the Massachusetts has a um, living history group, if you will, you can get involved in that. You can wear, um, they wear period, authentic period costume and talk to um, visitors about being, you know, in the Navy in World War II. Um, it's very, very, um, it's very happening, happening place right now. The Kennedy herself, uh, one thing I will say is that her future um, looks troubled because she needs a new hull, and that's looking at $15 million. So she needs to be dry docked quickly within two years. Um, so right now the Cove is um, reaching out to state and, and, and federal. Um, the Battleship Cove is a nonprofit, so um, obviously it resolves, um, it, it relies on the public um, for, for support. But um, thank you, and if you have any questions, I'll be feel free to ask them. <laughs> thank you. I work with Moran Towing Company. Oh, okay. And uh, I was with Providence Steamboat. And we were going to assist them, and she was going to be towed to uh, the Boston Navy shipyard mm -hmm. for manual overhaul. Oh, okay. And at the time, they told me the Navy never gives up ownership. They're letting you buy. Oh, yes, that is correct. Yes. And uh, they also, I got talking to a retired naval officer. And he was the guy who reactivated the Iowa class ships oh. during the Korean War. Oh, wow, interesting. And uh, she, this ship, I, as I remember, was 100 feet shorter than the Iowa class. Oh, really? Oh, wow. Yes, 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 there is. Yes. But he was saying that the fire control equipment he thought was the same on this ship. And uh, when they were activating the first of the battleships, uh, they brought in electronic uh, control mm -hmm. uh, for fire control and uh, they wanted him to remove all the old stuff he said well let's see if your stuff works <laughs> so they, they took it out and the first salvo they blew all the electronics of oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> any other questions did the um, Massachusetts have a uh, the, the Kingfisher on, on the Yes, they had two or three, yes. Yep. Get up to three. That, it would seem to me that uh, certain circumstances where they were low on fuel, they had to get in the water regardless of what the condition of the water was. Uh, how, how successful, I, I spoke, assume that it was successful most of the time, but I, would there have been certain times where the, the, the Water was so bad that... Oh, they couldn't they, land. Oh, yeah, the f water had to be flat, yes. Well, yep. if, if they had to land, but mm -hmm. if they were low on fuel, uh, they didn't have a choice, uh, then they could potentially be in, in 
rather difficult circumstances. Oh, yes, to yes. To pull it out of the, oh, yes. It's a rough water. Yes. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. Any other questions? What shape of the hull is the Massachusetts? Uh, actually, her hull was redone in 1998, so she's actually in pretty good shape. The, mess, the, the, the Joseph P. Kennedy Jr. wasn't dry docked, it was last time dry docked in 1986. So, and she's a destroyer, so as you know, her hull's paper thin, so um, she's in trouble. Any other questions? Yeah. Jim, just a note. Uh, I also volunteer at oh, yes. Cold, but uh, uh, like you mentioned, but it might not hit you as hard as I want to hit you with it now is its 50th anniversary of arrival of the Cold River. So they're planning a lot of events that are happening. You might have seen in the Providence Journal just last weekend, they had a, an astronaut there, they had Space Day. So they're building up to a lot of things come August. So uh, keep your eye out for, for visitation. If I can make a remark, I think, in my opinion, Massachusetts is really special, mm -hmm. more special than some of the newer Iowa-class ships, which are memorials Mm -hmm. Norfolk or Pearl Harbor, mm -hmm. because everything on the Massachusetts is left in World War II condition. Yes. As opposed to you go aboard the, the Missouri and Hawaii, and it's mm -hmm. got computers and newer bunks and missile launchers mm -hmm. up on the main deck. Mm -hmm. And the Massachusetts is as pretty much as it was. I find yes. It remarkable to look at that old technology mm -hmm. really mm -hmm. how it must have been like in World War II. Yeah, no. No, thank you, thank you. And I know that Chris Nardi, who's a curator and the staff, they work really hard um, at you know keeping that in the World War II configuration. Thank you. Any other question? Can you go there by boat? I uh, believe <laughs> if you can get a um, that I don't know. I mean, I'm sure that you can get there. I know there's a marina nearby, and I mean, I'm sure the I don't know that if you need a permit or not, but <laughs> or a mooring or something. But um, I'm sure you can. <laughs> Any other questions? All right, thank you. <laughs>